service this evening. Psalm 32, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. Psalm 32, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found, surely in the floods of great waters. They shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which hath no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. And he, but he that trusteth in the Lord shall mercy compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice ye righteous, and shout for joy all ye that are upright in heart. Have you ever lost anything before? I think my life is filled with losing things. And Josiah's life is anyway. He's <laughs> laughing about it. That's good. I can still remember uh, the first time and most memorable time that I lost my wallet. I was just talking to a student this morning who uh, lost his wallet. We were talking about replacing the driver's license and I sent him a text uh, this morning telling him he could probably get it online and order the replacement rather than having to appear in person. But when you lose your wallet, Uh, That's a very uncomfortable feeling for a guy. I remember I lost my wallet and for two or three days I wandered around in uncertainty. I'd lost my license, my debit card, and a credit card. And by the way, for those of you who get nervous about a credit card, let me tell you a secret. Pay it off every month, all right? Uh, Don't live in debt up to your ears all the time, all right? And so I lost all of those things. And uh, after two or three days, I finally gave up and got a new license I got uh, my cards all ordered and ready to come. And then the day after I did all that, I found the wallet. But better safe than sorry. But it was an uncomfortable feeling, especially for a couple of days. I remember another time where I lost my keys. As a young staff member, I had keys to a lot of different things here on campus. I misplaced my keys and it worried me because I said, all these other doors that are usually locked, now somebody can get in. And I searched and I searched and I searched and finally I found my keys and and all was well. And, And perhaps, especially for a preacher, I think it ought to be true of any Christian, but when you misplace your Bible, that ought to be an uncomfortable feeling. Sometimes I'm a little bothered that somebody can leave a Bible and just it's like they don't miss it for a week. And maybe they have their Bible where they sit in their pew at church and they use another one at home. But there are some people, they lose their Bible, they say they're Christians, and yet they hardly miss it. But for as a preacher, you know, when you misplace your Bible, I mean, you mispl- you're misplacing your outlines. You're misplacing the thoughts that you've jotted down. I mean, it's like your right arm. And finally, after frantically searching, I finally found my Bible. But this morning, I don't want to talk to you about losing your keys or losing your wallet. I don't even want to talk to you about losing your Bible. But I do want to talk to you about this, and that's losing your joy. When you read Psalm 32, you find a man who had lost his joy. It might surprise you, this man who lost his joy, this was a man who at times was declared to be a, the, a man after God's own heart. The man who lost his joy was the shepherd of Israel, who wrote songs, wrote hymns, and God said, I like that so much, David, I'm going to put it in a book for all the world to read. And yet we find a man who was a powerful servant of the Lord, and yet we find him without joy. 
And it just goes to show that shepherds are not the only ones, kings are not the only ones who can learn to live without joy, but college students and Christians at large can do the same. We go day after day more thrilled by the things of the world than the Word of God. We manage to put a smile on our face, but it's not because of a joy that comes from deep within from the Lord, but it's one that we manufacture so that we can put on a show so that everyone can think that everything's okay. But David lost his joy, and in Psalm 32 you find out how he rediscovered it. He rediscovered his joy, basically summed up in one word, confession. I'm about finished with my Bible reading plan and soon to start another one. Right now I'm finishing up reading in Nehemiah and the book of Revelation. And it's really interesting in, the Revel- or excuse me, in Nehemiah, there's a service that transpires and the Bible says that for a fourth part of the day they read the Bible. Now, many people would be blown away by that type of a service. Brother Robertson says, we're going to stand for the next three hours and we're going to read 1 Chronicles together. But not only did they read the Bible a fourth part of the day, but the Bible tells us that they confessed a fourth part of the day. And it's interesting, with those two things coupled together, it said they read the Bible a fourth part of the day, they confessed a fourth part of the day, and then it says, and worshipped. You know, when you talk about worship today, the words that come most commonly to the minds of Christians are singing, reading the Bible, and going to church. And all of those have their place, young people, but do you understand... If you're going to worship God, confession has to be part of it. You can't bow before the Lord unless you're willing to admit your shortcomings. You can't bow before God and worship Him without admitting the darkest things of your heart, the deceit that's there. And my prayer is this morning is that before this service is over with, that we'd make the choice, if we need to, to worship God by confessing. So to see David's plight this morning, I want to show you several things. Number one, I want you to see a clean conscience that David has. It's expressed in verses 1 and 2. This is a psalm of confession. It's written, I believe, after the fact or as it's even taking place, but in verses 1 and 2, David indicates a very, very solid confidence when he says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. How can a man speak with freedom like that? How can a man speak with confidence like that? Well, it only comes after confession. We come to this point in the Bible, David's made a disastrous mistake. He chose to yield to the lust of the flesh instead of the Spirit of God. And in doing something like that, he marred his family. It had long-lasting effects. And David, for perhaps months, even up to a year, some Bible scholars say that he resisted confessing his sin and he covered it. And finally, he's come to a point of breaking. The prophet of God comes to David, tells him a story. David's thinking, that's a nice story. And then the prophet says, thou art the man. And David begins to break and he prays a prayer of repentance, a prayer of confession. And after doing so, he begins to say, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. I want to ask you this morning, do you have a clean conscience? Is your conscience clean this morning? Is it one of those things where you don't have to constantly look over your shoulder and wonder who's looking? To be able to sit in the pew and not have to worry if mom and dad find out or if the preacher finds out, do you have a clear conscience? There's some of you that perhaps you say to yourself, you know, I don't have to worry about mom and dad. You've covered very well, but you do live before God. 
Paul talks about this in Acts chapter 23 and verse number 1. He says, and it says, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. You know, so often we talk about doing right in the sight of your parents. We talk about doing right in the sight of your parents. Throw all of that away for a moment. Listen, where are you at in the sight of God? Do you have a clean conscience? And then in Acts 24 verse 16, Paul said, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. The simple question is, are you clean? Brother Crow preached about that in the very first opening day of being the importance of being clean. You know, whenever you're dirty, whenever you're filthy, nobody wants to have anything to do with you. Your wife, your mother, no one. You want to be disowned, just be filthy and dirty. But in our spiritual condition, when we're blemished, when, we're just, when we, we are just harboring sin and we're covering sin, you understand we can't have a clean conscience. And notice in verse number 2, at the end of the verse, it says this, it says, And in whose spirit there is no guile. Let me tell you, I'm not just talking about being clean on the outside. There are people, they do their best to make themselves look clean on the outside. If you have that inordinate thing where you can hold standards and you hold them to a T and you can look clean on the outside, but yet in your spirit not be right, you're not clean. We want you to be clean in and out in your spirit. Some of you came to school and maybe there's some things that are still bound up in your soul, things that you've refused to deal with, attitudes that you have that are holding you back. Listen to me, you can leave this chapel service today with a clean conscience and say with David, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. But I want to hurry from a clean conscience. The second thing that I want you to see this morning is a constant conviction that David experienced. Now what was David's soul like during this time where he is covering his sin instead of confessing it? Well, verses 3 and 4 are very vivid. I think it refers heavily to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. What's David referencing? David's basically saying, When I kept silence, when I kept my mouth closed, My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. He's basically saying, listen to me, my sin and covering it aged me. I think it's a well-established fact, well outside of the Christian community that sin ages a person. All you have to do is look at mug shots to know that. I've seen testimonial pages where you would find somebody that was on meth. They got hooked on meth and you see by the time they're the age of 30, they look like they're 60. You know, I think it's outside of Christian circles. A little common sense and honesty demands that sin ages us. We live in a day and time where people are infatuated with looking younger. Now understand, I'm not making a beeline to the old folks' home, but I just realized Father Time has come and gone, and there's just... You take care of yourself, but listen, when it's all said and done, you're going to get older. But there's some people that they're really fixated on looking younger. Uh, You hear about surgeries, facelifts. There's some ladies that have had so many facelifts, their belly button's at the top of their forehead. (laughs) You're just like, wow, where does this madness ever stop? But you know, I've never met one person say, you know what, I'd just like to look a lot older. You know, I'd like for my knees to ache. I'd like for my blood pressure to be high. I'd like for all of my hair to fall out. <laughs> I, I've, never, I've never known a person really to be that way, at least who's sane. But can I tell you something? Whenever you sit in this student body and you choose to cover your sin 
and not confess it, one thing I'll promise you, it'll age you somehow, some way. It will wear on you. If you're a Christian, listen to me. The Holy Spirit of God will convict your heart and work in your life. And you may do all that you can to quench it and to push it away. But listen, it's still there. He said, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. And then he said, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. He said, whether I was at home, whether I was at work, whether I was out and about or I was all alone, day and night the hand of God was heavy upon me. And all the moisture had turned into the drought of summer. He uses that imagery to talk about the constant conviction of the Holy Spirit. I was married uh, in between my junior and senior year of college. I was working at McDonald's my last year of uh, school. And uh, I still remember I would come home late at night and uh, my wife has a very sensitive nose. There may be some of you very sensitive to smell. She's, she can smell anything. I mean, I could walk out of a gas station and somebody could be chewing gum of strawberry flavor and she'd be like, you smell like strawberries. You know, it's, like, it's not quite that bad, but it seemed like it to me sometimes. But it was uncanny. And, you know, I came to a point where I would come home at night and because you were working in fast food and such, my hands sometimes would smell like pickles and she could always smell that. Just very, it was a very distinct smell and she could pick right up on it. So I remember I came home one night. It was in the winter time. We lived in a trailer that uh, we had to take a kerosene heater like from room to room because the heat was horrible in it. And it was one of those things at night it was just cold. And so I still remember I got home, I hopped into the shower and I still remember scrubbing my hands in the shower. And even after I got finished, I went to the sink and as I'm brushing my teeth, I scrubbed my hands down, you know, and I turned the sink off and I made a beeline for the bed and uh, jumped right in there. It was cold. I was in my bare feet. I pulled the covers all the way up to my chin. And uh, I was the kind at that time, maybe not so much now, but I was like five seconds and I was asleep. Man, I jumped in there and I pulled those covers up and at about four and a half seconds, my wife wakes up and looks at me and she says, Honey, do you hear that? I said, Hear what? She said, Listen. And very faintly, I heard, Plip. (laughs) Plop. I said, I hear that, honey. I said, I'll get it in the morning. (laughs) She said, no, you won't. (laughs) She said, you don't understand. Not only is she a good smeller, but she can be a light sleeper. She said, honey, I'll stay awake all night if I hear that. I still remember some of the disgust that I felt in my soul. I thought, why? As I got out of bed and on that cold linoleum floor, ran to the bathroom, wrenched those sink handles as hard as I could and run back to bed. But it was amazing the sensitivity that she had, plip, plop, just, just, I mean, of the faintest thing. And yet she was sensitive to that. And you know what I found in my life that sometimes... When I am being stubborn and I'm wrestling with things, that there is a steady drip in the back of my soul. And there's only one way you can turn it off. And that's to confess. When's the last time you've experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit? You know, a lot of times we talk about these things in theory, but listen to me, it's real. The day that I got saved, I experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And manifold times in my life as a Christian, I've experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit. How will you respond to it this week? How will you respond to it today? You know, at the end of verse 4, you find a very interesting word. It's the word selah. You ever heard that word before? If you've read the book of Psalms, you've seen it. 
I remember I'd listen to a radio, Christian radio station and this man would always say, Sila, meditate on this. Some of you are laughing. You've heard it too. It's the idea of thinking upon something. It's the idea of dwelling upon something. Do you know that word sila is found in a very interesting verse? Usually when I think of that word, I think about the blessings of God and the mercies of the Lord, that those are the things that we ought to think upon. But David says, For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned to the drought of summer. Think about it. This morning, I'm asking you not only to think about the blessings, I'm saying you better think about the conviction and what God is trying to bring about in your heart. I think there'll be times where you come to chapel. You know, God uses college life in so many ways. Some of you are like, I'm just trying to get through classes. You know, you've got so many other spheres around that. It's not just classes. It's like relationships. It's like back home. It's like work. And all that stuff's going to come crashing together. And there's going to be times that you're going to find yourself out of sorts. There's times where your attitude will need to be in check. And listen, when those times come and you experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit, listen, instead of pushing God away, respond to it. Confess your sin and forsake it. David speaks of a clean conscience. He speaks of a constant conviction. But the third thing he talks about is a clear confession. It's found in verse 5. It's interesting. Remember the context of this passage. David has committed a sin with Bathsheba. Let me ask you, does your Bible read this way? Does David say, I acknowledged her sin unto thee? You know, this this confession is very clear. You know why it's very clear? Because David owns it. I believe there may be some of you, you have a real problem with confession. Why? Because you have to own your sin and you don't like that. It's sort of like when you get parents, you become a parent and your child disobeys and you look at your wife and say, get your son. Well, the truth is he's your son. We live in a day that just, it makes blame shifting so normal. It's her fault. David didn't say it was her fault. David said, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. Have you ever hidden sin before? You know you have. Don't look at me so pious. Matter of fact, a lot of us could get a Ph.D. in it because we followed our human nature rather than the Spirit of God. You ever withheld something from your parents? You ever lied on a CSR? You ever covered your sin? Purposely withheld information so that you wouldn't get in trouble because you knew that if you were honest that it would be devastating? My sin have I not hid from thee. You know, my heart is very sympathetic for the dean of students office because I served in there for a number of years. I've often told Brother Lucan, you have to think like a lawyer. But you know, once in a while in DC meetings, we would get to a thing that, or in dean of students office, we'd get to a thing that was called a discipline committee meeting. And can I tell you, I hate discipline committee meetings. I hate them. I hate what brings them about. And I hate sometimes the results of them. I don't enjoy that. I, I'd like, I would rather go to a dentist's office than to go to a D.C. meeting. That's the way I feel about it. But every once in a while, we'd get to a discipline committee meeting where somebody had committed a major offense and they thought that we only knew this much. And so they would come in, and we would begin questioning them, and they were answering like a lawyer, very precise. I don't recall. That could have happened, but I'm not really sure. 
And then finally, you'd get a little indisputable piece of evidence. And finally, they would say, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, you know what, I, I did do that. And then you would say, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? And they'd be like, no, I think we're good. And then the dean of students at that time, who used to be a chemical engineer, who was very analytical and well-researched, would pull out his paper and he would say, and he would start referencing another situation and another piece of evidence that was indisputable. And the guy would be like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot. Oh, how could I have forgotten? Yes, 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 yeah, I, I did. I did that too. And uh, I am so sorry. I, I just. I... And then after that, the dean of students would peel off another onion layer. He'd say, well, the other day, and he'd start, you know what, I, I forgot that too. You know what, we laugh, but by the time that meeting was over with, let me tell you, that fella was not clear at all. He was deceitful and he was covering himself and he only confessed as much as he thought people knew. That's not confession. You see, we need to change. You know what confession is? Confession isn't just confessing to what you think people know. Confessing is being honest before God. There have been other times in a D.C. meeting where a student would come and I mean they're sobbing before you could even ask a question and I mean they just spilled their guts. And the more they told, the more you thought, man, this is worse than I thought. But you know what? We didn't want to raise up with knives and stab the person to death. Our hearts broke with them. Why? Because they were responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, listen to me, with clear confession. If you want to be clean, it's not confessing to what you think other people know. It's confessing to what God knows. He said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. You know, I think clear confession, it ought to be specific. It ought to be specific about you being involved in it. It ought to be specific. You ought not cover anything with it. Let me ask you a question. If I wronged you and you only knew a part of that wrong... And then I confessed a little bit more later and a little bit more later as it's discovered and as it's found out. Because it's not very specific and because it's not very thorough, your confidence is shaken in that confession and rightfully so. A clear confession ought to be specific. It ought to be thorough. We've already talked about that. When you just confess to what other people you think they know, listen, no, a clear confession says here it is. Here it is. It's all laid out. And a clear confession is also sincere. You know, sometimes we're really good at sniffing out insincerity with everyone else but ourselves. When you say, I'm sorry... Some people say, I'm sorry because they got caught. Somebody says, how can you tell if somebody's really sincere or not? I I don't know that I have a a real catch-all answer with it, but I will tell you, in time, you'll learn about sincerity. In time, you'll see whether somebody was really truly sincere or not. When's the last time your heart was so caught up with something and you came before the Lord and you said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because of the hurt that it's caused to your name. Lord, I'm sorry. When's the last time you've apologized to another human being? David said in Psalm 38 and verse 18, he said, I will be sorry for my sin. Confession is useless without sorrow. And sometimes we don't even know how to discern between I'm sorry I got caught and I'm really sorry. But there's, there's some people, that's why they're sorry. That's not true confession. 
you know, basically when it comes to this idea of a clear confession, it really comes down to Proverbs 28 verse 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Listen, when we cover sin, we cover it from the eyes of man. But young people, let me tell you, God has a way of uncovering. And when He does, it's not very pleasant. It hurts us and it hurts others around us. And we'll all make a choice this morning. You'll either confess your sin or you'll cover it. Which one will you do? Brother Childs, who I referenced earlier, one day I was sitting in his class and uh, there were several things that I still remember Brother Childs saying. Often he would say, live with open hands. He would also say partial obedience is total disobedience, talking about Saul and the Amalekites. But another thing that he said in class that made a lot of sense to me, he said, you know what, it's easier to confess your sin than to cover it. Now, you may have to swallow your pride, and that makes for a hard initial offering. But you know, when you cover sin, it gets pretty difficult. Why? Because you have to remember lies. To cover sin, you have to make up other email addresses or get other phone numbers so that you're not, the trail is not found. To cover your sin, you have to delete a history or uninstall an app. The truth is, it's just a lot easier just to live true blue and remember the truth and live right before God. And some of us expend our energy covering when the truth is we ought to be confessing. He talks about a clear confession. But another thing that I want you to see quickly this morning is that he talks about a continual comfort in verses 6 and 7. It's like there's a sigh of relief after this confession. It talks about, then verse 7, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Here you find a little surge of joy. Why? Because whenever you deal with sin, then there can be a comfort that's in your soul that you didn't have before. You know, it's good to have a confidence in your heart knowing that you're right with God and knowing that you are in that relationship with God. When I was a kid, I was terribly scared of the dark. I was so scared of the dark that in the trailer that we lived in, I would take a running start to my bed and about four feet away from the edge, I would leap into the bed because I was afraid whatever was under it was going to pull me under. I was so scared of the dark that even in 90 degree North Carolina weather in a trailer without an air conditioner running, I would pull the covers all the way up to my chin and if I saw a closet door open, I would go to the edge of my bed, lean over and close the closet door, close every last window and pull the covers up to my chin as if covers were going to protect me. But you know what, there were certain times where I I was so scared, I just could not get over it, that I would call for my mom. And my mom would come in, and she didn't jump four inch, four feet away from the edge of the bed. And she would tell me to roll over, and I would throw the covers back. And you know, it was amazing. When I knew mom was there, no monster was going to whip me. Because mom was going to whip the monsters. At that time, my mom would have been in her 40s with cerebral palsy, and I knew, I didn't care. I knew mom would take care of any one of them that came out. She'd whip them for me. It was amazing when I knew that she was right there, when I had that confidence. You know, I could go to sleep. I had a peace of mind. Listen, sometimes through life, we push God away, and yes, while He indwells us, we don't have a sense of His presence. Why? Because of sin, and we go through life afraid. We go through life frustrated. When the truth is, we could confess our sin and we could have that confidence that David did. But the last thing that I want you to see this morning is I want you to see a challenging comparison. Verse 9, it says, Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. You ever had somebody come up to you and say, Hey, you remind me of someone. 
you know, what are you supposed to do? I'll go up to a church and say, boy, you, you look just like my cousin. And I, what are you supposed to say? I just say, well, I'm sorry that two of us have to look this way and just deflect it and go on. I mean, you know, it's one of those things, you know, I just, you, know, you don't say, well, he's blessed. I just don't do that. <laughs> Some of you would, but I don't think I would. Um, but what would you think? If you're a lady in this room and somebody came up to you in a church and said, you know, man, you remind me of something. And you look at, you look at the person, you say, really what? And he said, you remind me of a mule. You'd say, I'm going to remind him of a purse. <laughs> right upside the head. Now, things like that aren't nearly as offensive to the guys, but I imagine some of you would be taken back if you went up to a church and a little old lady came up to you and she said, How do you remind me of a horse? <laughs> some of you eat like horses, I'm sure, you fellas. But you know, those are two animals. The truth is, they're really not the, the, the most complimentary animal. But he says, be ye not as the horse or as the mule. Why is this? They have no understanding. You know how those animals have to be led about so, many of the so much of the time? They have to be led about by pain. When you put that bit in the horse's mouth and somebody pulls to the left and it begins to hurt, the horse says, I think I'm going to turn left. When you pull back to the right and the horse says, that hurts, I think I'm going to turn this way. They have to be led by pain. How many mules have been slapped and prodded and pushed? They have to be led by pain. I had a neighbor growing up who got a horse and after he got it, it was soon, soon after, he said, would you like to ride this horse? I'd never, I'd never been on a horse in my life. No saddle, no anything. It was bareback. He threw me up on it. He said, listen, all you got to do is, he said, if you want him to go left, you take his mane and you pull to the left. If you want him to go right, you take his mane and pull to the right. If you want him to stop, you grab his mane and pull backwards and he'll stop. I said, well, that's simple enough. And he slapped the horse on the hind end and the horse began to run. And it was one of those things I'd never ex experienced before. When the horse is in granny gear, it's like this. But when he begins to do this... I'm like, okay, we're heading somewhere now. And I looked out in the distance. I saw a ditch. I grabbed the mane. I pulled to the left. Nothing happened. <laughs> I, grabbed the, I pulled the mane to the right. Nothing happened. And I'm telling you, as we jumped over that ditch, that horse had to be looking me in the eyes as I pulled his mane and pulled back as hard as I could. And the horse landed on the other side, and I still remember laying in that ditch with two clumps of horse hair <laughs> in my hands. And I'll assure you, I wasn't laughing. You know, there was a horse, if he was going to do what he needed to do, he's going to have to be, he was going to have to be led by pain. Can I tell you, God does not want to have to constantly lead you by pain. Some of you need to spit out the bit and bridle and listen to a still small voice. You've come to college and there's a lot of excitement. You're like, wow, this is a new environment. This looks like it's going to be camp for 16 weeks. <laughs> Some of you are like, I'm already making new friends and I'm already doing all kinds of things. Listen to me. If you don't deal with this matter of confession, it's going to be a long semester. Because eventually the glitz and the glamour is going to wear off. The distractions will pass by the wayside and there'll still be somebody knocking in your heart. And it's easier to confess your sin than to cover it. The last two verses give you a choice. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Listen to me. Every one of you will fall in one of those two, verse, one of those two aspects of the verse. 
You continue hiding, there'll be many sorrows. You confess, you'll have mercy. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. I want to ask you, have you lost your joy? Have you gone long smiling along the way, but you know that there are things in your heart that you've not dealt with? Listen, instead of waiting until a Friday night message, may God break our hearts and may we come to the point of realizing that it's easier to confess our sin than to cover it. And may today you find... your